So this title is a rather rather grand one, isn't it? Um, uh, you know, it's said that the Buddha um, um, uh, conquered death. In fact, what is said is that he entered the deathless. Uh, the question puts it in terms of him uh, transcending even death. Um, so what on earth does that mean? So I'm going to have to wind into this, and it's going to be a somewhat circuitous route I take to try to answer the question. But it takes us into some very, very important central issues of the Dhamma. I gather that some of you are really quite new. I hope you'll be able to uh, um, digest what's coming. Of course, you'll have your own approach to it, but let's see. Let's see how we get on. Let's plunge into that uh, <laughs> river and <laughs> carry on. So, um, yes, the, 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 the question is what, in a sense, what happens to the Buddha after death? Well, fortunately, we've got the Buddha's own response to this. There's a famous occasion in which he was approached by another, a wanderer, um, somebody who was put on the, the yellow robe and was wandering, not connected with Buddhism, but there were many different sects at that time, just wandering in the forests, begging for food. And he was of a somewhat metaphysical inclination. So he came to the Buddha and asked him a series of key metaphysical questions. He asked, it, asked him, is it that you teach that the cosmos is eternal? So the Buddha said, no. So he said, so, okay, do you teach that the cosmos is uh, 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 finite, temporarily? He said, no. By now he's beginning to scratch his head. So he said, is it that you teach that the uh, cosmos, the universe, is both eternal and not eternal? He said, no. So he's tried one more time, the famous tetralemma. He said, therefore, is it that you say that it is both uh, neither eternal nor, uh, or nor not eternal? He said, no. So the questions went on. The next question was to do with uh, the, the uh, spatial uh, extent of the universe. Was it finite or infinite? The same series of responses. Then he asked him, is the, uh, the, the, the mind the same as the body or different? The Buddha replied no to each alternative. So then he went on to say, does the, the Buddha, let's just call it that, he says Tathagata, but it means Buddha, does the Buddha exist uh, after death? No. Or rather, do you teach that the Buddha exists after death? No. Do you teach that he does not exist after death? No. Do you teach that he both exists and does not exist? No. Do you teach that he both neither uh, exists nor doesn't exist after death? That pretty much exhausts all the possibilities, I think. So again, the response is no. The, the wanderer, whose name is Vachogotta, uh, is very bewildered, very confused. That's what the text says. He's confused, bewildered. He doesn't know what to make of, uh, uh, of um, what, what's, what's happening. And so he asks the Buddha to uh, clarify. But what the Buddha says is that basically these are all abstract questions. They're, 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 they're removed from actual experience. And when you take these large questions and uh, uh, abstract, uh, abstract to make these large questions, they just don't add up. Anybody who's familiar with, uh, with Western philosophy will know of Kant and the, the famous uh, antinomies of reason, um, which, which come to the same sort of conclusion, really, that you cannot make grand statements, what Kant called ideas that are too big for our minds. I like that thought of a sort of an idea that's just not quite fitting in your head. You, th you can think it, but it actually has no reference. You cannot know an infinite universe. Anyway, the main point is that the Buddha basically said, Sabuti, don't try to answer this question, because there is no answer, or any answer that you give will be misleading. 
uh, and uh, erroneous, therefore. But we've got a whole 50 minutes to fill in, so I'd better have a <laughs> shot. <laughs> um, so, uh, obviously, when, when we think about death in general, let alone the, the, the death of a, of a Buddha, we generally think in terms of two alternatives. Either when we die, that's it, and this is probably the, the commonest view amongst people today. Um, materialism has led us to identify uh, uh, life exclusively, even consciousness exclusively, with the existence of the body. So when the body ceases to exist, we think that's it. Even, I think, quite a lot of people who espouse religious views actually are more convinced by the materialist outlook than they like to admit. Whereas the other alternative is that there is some kind of eternal existence after death. These are the two broad alternatives that we have. The second alternatively invo involves some kind of belief. You have to have some set of ideas, some belief about it. Uh, and uh, in a way, our, our modern sceptical minds, I think rather rightly, lead us to uh, find it difficult to simply accept such a thing. But, of course, Buddhism accepts neither of those two alternatives. Buddhism argues that uh, life and death are a sequence. We live, we die, we born again, we die again, we're born again, we die again. That is the, the classic Buddhist teaching, going back to the Buddha himself, and which I would say that until modern Buddhism in the West has arisen, it's been universally accepted, but many modern Buddhists, uh, or some modern Buddhists, um, it's still rather secular in their outlook, as materialist in their outlook, and impose that upon Buddhism. We don't do that here, we take the Buddha's own teaching which is, it's absolutely clear that the Buddha did teach uh, uh, rebirth. The idea that there's a stream of consciousness which uh, uh, is connected with a stream of willing, a stream of desire, of karma. And that stream of karma shapes consciousness in the future. It shapes life in the future. So our actions now shape well, our experience tomorrow, and then will it shape our experience after death. This is the fundamental Buddhist teaching. So that uh, death is not considered the final end, it's considered simply uh, the, uh, the, a break before a new beginning. Of course, there's not a continuity of, of little old me. It's not that Sabuti will be exactly re reborn, you'll be glad to hear. Um, but that... Um, something will arise, some poor little bugger will arise on the basis of, of what I've done during this life. Which is something to consider, you're responsible for a, a life in the future and your actions will have an effect on somebody in the future who will not know why they're afflicted as they are. Uh, because your actions sort of resonate uh, in, in the stream of consciousness as it re-emerges and will, without somebody who necessarily knowing where it comes from, will resonate within them. So, um, yes, this, this is the fundamental Buddhist teaching. Uh, but um, I'd, I'd like to understand a little bit better what we mean by death, so that we can un understand better what the answer to the question, what happens to the Buddha after death, uh, can, be, can be answered. So, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Buddhist teaching is that this life, our experience in this life, arises in dependence on a whole mass of different factors. It's all dependent, every single element of it. Our bodies are dependent. They're dependent, of course, upon our parents and the, uh, the coming together of sperm and ovum. They're dependent on the food that we eat. They're dependent upon the sun shining upon us and keeping us warm, and so forth. Everything, 
that we think of ourselves as being uh, is, arises because of conditions, many of which are beyond our control. The only condition we have real control over is karma. Our actions now shape our experience in the future to some extent. So yes, we, 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 from the Buddhist point of view, this life is simply a mass of conditions temporarily, uh, temporarily combining together to form now. Right now, everything that's happening right now for each of us depends upon a whole mass of conditions. Uh, and those conditions arise, they pass away. Some point, those conditions will begin to break down. Uh, and the body will begin to uh, break up and the whole system will fade and fail. That is the, the fundamental Buddhist position. It happens again and again and again. So what happens when the whole thing begins to fade? This is uh, um, detailed in the, the book that uh, uh, Gaudamavati mentioned at the beginning which is known as the Tibetan Book of the Dead. It's not the proper name for it. The proper name is, uh, the, in Tibetan, Bardo Todo. Bardo is the between state, <coughs> the state between birth and death, in, sorry, death and birth in particular, although it has more rich meaning than that, but let's take it in that way. Um, uh, Todo uh, means um, uh, hearing, or liberation through hearing. So it's often translated as the, the book of liberation through hearing. Because what the, the book uh, purports to do is be a guide to the death process. Uh, to what happens as you're dying, what happens after uh, death has taken place, and what happens as you're coming to be reborn. And it gives a, a fairly... Um, detailed guide what's happening, what you need to do in order to take advantage of what's happening because it's possible to gain liberation at every moment in this process as it's possible to gain liberation at every moment in life itself. So the book tells us uh, through the voice of the, the guru who whispers in our ear as we're dying who whispers even in the ear of the, uh, the corpse and continues to uh, talk to us, talk us through the process so that we know what to do, so we're guided in the process of finding our way, what's called the dangerous pathway that leads from death to birth. This is the Buddhist point of view. Accept it or not, it's up to you. But that is the Buddhist perspective and the, the, uh, the so-called uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Bardo Todol, gives the best account that we have in the Buddhist tradition of this whole process. So the, the process is divided into three parts. I'm not going to go into all of this, although it's absolutely fascinating. It's a, a topic I've studied again and again because it seems so true, so true to life, so true to ordinary experience, to moments of great sickness or you know, let's be frank about it, certain drug experiences, you can see the same process being, uh, being replayed on lesser levels. So death is, is the big one. You can even see it on a retreat. Uh, when you go on retreat, there's a sort of death. You're leaving behind your old life and you enter a, a space, which particularly if you're quite new, is an unfamiliar one, and you often find very intense experiences arising often very very uh, blissful, very positive, very clear, sometimes a little bit, uh, bit uh, uh, frightening maybe. And uh, you, you, you go through a sort of mini death uh, and you learn, therefore, to take advantage of what's happening and use your consciousness really well so that you can uh, gain greater wisdom and begin to develop greater compassion. So, uh, yes, the, the book describes this process of fading out of life. It's described as uh, earth fading into water. So the sort of solid uh, 
element of things, the, the solidity of your experience, begins to fade. Everything becomes a bit more fluid, a bit more watery. You can sometimes get this if you're very ill, and even, I've experienced it, when I'm about to faint. You know, if I'm very ill and, and uh, I'm fighting fainting, I can experience that as if my, my, I'm beginning to float off the ground, the, the, uh, the, the, the solid side of things, the solid aspects of things, begins to well, become less solid, becomes much more fluid. Then water fades into fire, so uh, everything becomes very sort of intense and, uh, uh, um, yes, hot, you could say, but hot metaphorically, not so much uh, <laughs> literally. Although there is heat, you'll experience heat withdrawing into the centre of the body. And then finally fire, or then next, fire fades into air. So you become very, very light, just like breath, floating in and out, in and out. Uh, the solid side of things has just sort of faded again. Because all these conditions that support our ordinary experience, our ordinary life, are breaking down. So we cannot sustain our normal experience of ourselves. We can't experience our bodies in the same way. We can't experience even our minds, particularly as we move into fire and air. Our ability to think breaks down. There's just sort of pure feeling, if you like. Uh, there's no uh, ability to identify or name. A very intense experience of, uh, of, uh, of feeling. Then everything becomes really spacious. Uh, just spread out, completely spread out. So this process, and again I say that it's a not unfamiliar one, I think, if you, if you can think back over periods of abnormal physiological functioning, moments when your body is not functioning quite well, whether because you're ill or because you've uh, taken some mushrooms or something like that. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> um, in fact, I, I don't know whether I should tell you this. I remember many years ago, <laughs> therefore I have to. I remember taking an LSD trip uh, using Timothy Leary's Psychedelic Experience, which is based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And I experienced all the phases that are described in the Book of the Dead, not, of course, of the same intensity. But I could see that when you, when you mess with the body, it starts to... The consciousness behaves differently within it, as it were. And, uh, you know, sometimes very interestingly, sometimes very blissfully, sometimes very alarmingly. It's mainly my experience of that. But um, you, your, 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 your ordinary experience, which is sustained by a whole mass of conditions, when those conditions are broken down, your ordinary experience is radically different. <coughs> uh, and you... you uh, you're more and more thrust into simple awareness. There's just awareness. Um, with, you know, as the process becomes more and more intense, there's just awareness. So I'm going to read you what the book describes as happening at this point. What happens when we get to the point where space even is dissolved into into consciousness, there are various phases that are gone through. So I want to just read you what the, the book of the, uh, of the Dead, so-called, has to say about this, because it's very powerful. It may need a bit of unpacking. I'm using technology for purely uh, dhammic purposes. Uh, I hope it's going to work. Sorry about this. Always get your technology right before you... Oh, no, here it is. So, the, uh, you imagine that uh, you're dying. You're, you're, you're pretty much dead. You've lost any sense of the body. You've lost a sense of a solid world out there. Uh, you're still very much aware. There's still an intensity of awareness. But it's no longer connected to the outer world. And your guide is, is uh, speaking to you. And what they're saying is this. Uh, um, oh, 
child of noble family is the tradition that's that is the traditional phrase that's used. Now the basic luminosity is shining before you. Recognize it and rest in the practice. So the basic luminosity, what emerges at this point, is akin to an absolutely infinite light without a centre from which it is shining. Just light. Of course, in some senses, even the use of the word light is a metaphor, but it's the closest we can get to what is being experienced. Just uh, something extraordinarily powerful uh, that is um, without center, without focus, without dimension. This basic luminosity. Sometimes it's referred to as the white light. Uh, quite recently I had some trees cut down where I live because they got, uh, got the rot. And uh, I, asked, I got a tree surgeon to come and cut them down. And he was an ex-para, and uh, a paratrooper. And they're a pretty hard bitten lot. Um, and he was built like a tank. Um, and uh, after, after he'd, he'd uh, cut down the trees, we got talking. And uh, I don't remember quite why he did it. And he said he didn't usually talk about it. But he talked about uh, an experience he'd had in Iraq uh, when he was in the military and had been blown up by um, an um, improvised explosive device. And uh, he said that he'd been rushed to the, uh, the, the, the hospital and uh, the surgeon said that twice his heart had stopped and that technically he was dead on, on the table. He said his own experience was not of dying, his own ex experience was of a brilliant white light, a very, very intense white light, which was overwhelmingly positive, overwhelmingly creative, and in a sense even overwhelmingly desirable. And he felt himself floating into it, and he realised there was a figure standing between him and the light, and the sort of message from the figure was, not yet, go back. Not yet. And he's a completely ordinary guy, uh, not particularly educated. He certainly hadn't read the Book of the Dead. <laughs> when I told him about it, he was absolutely astonished. He never really heard anything about that sort of thing. But uh, that's what he experienced. And this is a quite common experience in near-death experiences, this intense white light. A lot of people apparently um, don't really fully experience it because it's sort of overwhelming and they recoil from it. So many people don't uh, unite with that white light. They, they sort of uh, they just move away. And maybe it only lasts for a, a split second. I think the text says a finger snap. Uh, and you have to have some training or maybe some good karma if you're able to sort of rest in it. Um, in which case it will last much longer. And as we will see, if you can recognise what it is, you may be able to unite with it. You may be able to stabilise yourself at that, at that level. Of course, the, the, uh, the, the, the previous experience you get is what we'll be teaching you here. Not all at once, but slowly, 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 we'll, we, we'll, we will give you the equipment to deal with that experience. We teach meditations in which you consciously go through that process of letting go of uh, earth, water, fire, air and space, even of consciousness, of, in the sense of my consciousness. Because at this level, it's no longer my consciousness. There's just consciousness. What you might say is a basic consciousness. And uh, so the, 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 um, the guide... Uh, it asks you to recognise what's happening, see what's happening and recognise it and then rest in it. Uh, take rest in it. Don't recoil from it. Don't try to run away from it. Don't chase after it. Just rest in it. Relax in it, you could say. So uh, the, the text then goes on. O child of name, noble family, and you then say the name, add your own name in here, listen. And apparently uh, the, the, the dying person has uh, 
uh, their, their senses especially sharp. I think it says at one point, eight times as, as sharp as normal. Take eight as simply a, a figure that tells us a lot. It's very much amplified. So the words that are being spoken to you uh, by your guide uh, echo within you. You hear them, despite what's going on. So the text goes on. Now, the pure luminosity of the Dharmata is shining before you. Recognize it. Dharmata is a, uh, uh, a, a, a word that's very difficult to translate, but um, it really means something like, well, really it means reality, of ultimate reality, the truth, the final truth, the real nature of things. So the pure luminosity of the Dharmata is shining before you. Recognize it. So something is happening. It's a very, very intense and deeply real, as real as it comes. It's, in a sense, the ultimate reality, the ultimate underlying reality, which is present all the time. But mostly, all these conditions that assemble our identity prevent us from experiencing it. They stand between us and it. So that's all broken down, so you're just left naked in the face of uh, this you know, pure luminosity of the Dhammata. Um, the text goes on. O child of noble family, at this moment your state of mind is by nature pure emptiness. It does not possess any nature whatever, neither substance nor quality such as colour, but it is pure emptiness. So emptiness here is not simply a void, a vacuity, as it were. It's, it's a, a, a quality of there being no fixed nature. It's the experience of things without any grasping onto them, nothing that you can grasp, nothing that you can hold on to, nothing that you can define. There's just complete openness. Uh, it's a, a mysterious openness which has no real words to accompany it. That's, that's why the Buddha refused to speak about what, he was, what, he, he, uh, what happened to a Buddha after death, because there are no words really to describe it. This text is having a go, but in the end it must miss, if you see what I mean. But maybe it communicates to us something of what it means to be a dead Buddha, or a, a Buddha whose body has died. Your state of mind is by nature pure emptiness. There's no defining characteristics. You can't say how big your mind is. You can't say where it is. You can't say what colour it is. You can't say how much it weighs. You can't say it's this and not that. It's got no features. It's not even mine. There's just awareness. Uh, and that uh, awareness is absolutely pure. There's nothing that defiles it. And, in fact, it's, uh, it's um, as we'll see later, supremely blissful. The text then goes on to say, this is the Dharmata, the female Buddha, Samantabhadri. Now, this is a bit complicated. This Samantabhadra and Samantabhadri are two uh, uh, archetypal figures who represent this ultimate state. So there's a male and a female figure who are depicted in sexual union. So what's been got at here is that there's an absolute uh, indissoluble union of two dimensions, as it were. But you don't experience them as separate dimensions. They appear absolutely simultaneously as part of the same overwhelming reality. Do you see what I mean? Uh, but in order to get at it, you've got to sort of divide it. You've got to uh, uh, um, take it apart, because that's what our minds can understand. Uh, because our minds are dualistic. But it's trying to talk about an experience that's beyond duality, that cannot be <coughs> thought, it's beyond concepts. So the, 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 the figure of Samantha Badri uh, is the, uh, 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 the Im imaginative depiction of this aspect of ultimate reality, of the aspect of ultimate reality that is pure emptiness, uh, without any character, without any nature, you might say. So the, the female figure represents the, the wisdom aspect of the experience. 
But this state of mind is not just blank emptiness. It is unobstructed, sparkling, pure and vibrant. Beautiful, isn't it? It's unobstructed. There's nothing that the, the mind is, as it were, expansive, except, of course, there's nothing to expand and nothing to expand through, but its nature is unobstructed. There's nothing opposing it, nothing confining it, no limits. Um, um, uh, but it's not, it's not blank emptiness, because when we hear the words emptiness, we think of a nothingness, a vacuity. But it's not emptiness in that sense. It's emptiness in the, in the sense of complete openness. It's uh, unobstructed, sparkling. It's just an image, isn't it? But it, it implies that it's something vibrant, dynamic, uh, without uh, being a thing, if you see what I mean. It's pure. It's pure insofar as that there's no, nothing to defile it. It just is uh, complete purity and vibrant. Yes, this, uh, this state of mind is not just blank emptiness. It is unobstructed, sparkling, pure and vibrant. This mind is the male Buddha Samantabhadra. Of course, it's not a separate mind at all. Uh, yes, it talks in terms of this mind and this mind, but that's just a way of trying to talk about it. And uh, it just uh, it, it uses the image of, of, uh, uh, of sexual union as a way of trying to communicate the complete and perfect interpenetration of two aspects of the experience, if you see what I mean, which are not separate aspects joined together, they are completely unified. These two, your mind, whose nature is emptiness without any substance whatever, and your mind, which is vibrant and luminous, are inseparable. This is the Dharmakaya of the Buddha. Well, I'm not going to spend time trying to explain what's meant by the Dharmakaya, but, it, but let's just say that it's the, the Buddha in his ultimate nature, who the Buddha really is. We see the Buddha in front of us as a human being, as it were, with a body. Who We know his history. We even can go to the places where he gained enlightenment. We can go to the place where he was born. But that's not really who he is, uh, if you see what I mean, because he has attained this state even in life. Even though he's functioning in this life, he's in contact with this dimension of his own mind, which is not his mind, but of mind itself. He's in contact with that all the time. And his death is simply the, the ceasing of the conditions uh, um, which have uh, um, you know, you know, made his life uh, move, as it were. And he's left simply with this state. So, um, yes, these two, your mind whose nature is emptiness without any substance whatever, and your mind which is vibrant and luminous, are inseparable. This is the Dharmakaya of the Buddha. This is the Buddha's real nature. This is what he really is. Uh, the, the appearance is just an appearance. He himself said, those who by my form do see me, they, the Buddha, do not know. Uh, it's only when you know the Dharma that you know the Buddha, because his nature is not to be uh, defined by any um, particularity of conditions. Those are simply a temporary uh, um, assemblage which depart at death. This mind of yours is inseparable luminosity and emptiness in the form of a great mass of light. It has no birth or death. Therefore, it is the Buddha of immortal light, um, Amitabha. Uh, again, another metaphor which I'm not going to unpack for you, but uh, the Buddha of immortal light. Uh, to recognize this is all that is necessary. When you recognize this pure nature of your mind as the Buddha, looking into your own mind is resting in the Buddha mind. So, you see what it's saying? It's saying this is actually your mind. Uh, what has just been described is your own mind, if only you were able to recognize it. But we're not in contact with that because we're identified with our life, as it were. 
We identify with our bodies, we identify with our gender, we identify with our nation, our race, or whatever it is, all those things. We identify with our, our particular skills, with our attainments, we identify with our relationships, we identify with our social background and so forth. We identify ourselves through all these things. We don't just identify, we're attached to that identity. Uh, we're attached to our bodies, we're attached to uh, our, our, our gender maybe, uh, and so on. We're attached to all that. That's uh, deeply sort of important to us. We think that's who we are, but it's just a temporary condition of things. It can change. It will change. It must change, because conditions are always changing. So if we, if we look um, into our own minds, then we are resting in the mind of the Buddha. Of course, there's a long process to get to that point, but that's fundamentally the process that you've begun even here this evening uh, in, in your meditation practice. You're, you're training yourself to be able to see the real nature of your mind, which is the same as the Buddha's mind. Your own mind, ultimately, is the mind of the Buddha. If you could only see it free from all these identifications, all these identities that are so important to us and that we will, what well, people will even die for and fight for uh, and uh, um, oppress others for, to, to sustain their identity, our identity. And uh, that uh, means that we do not see the ultimate truth of things, the ultimate truth of things which is actually within our own minds, within our own, the depths of our own experience. So, let me read this to you again, see if you can recognise your own mind in it. O child of noble family, listen. Now the pure luminosity of the Dhammatar, of reality, is shining before you. Recognise it. O child of noble family, at this moment your state of mind is by nature pure emptiness. It does not possess any nature whatever, neither substance nor quality, such as colour, but it is pure emptiness. This is the Dharmata, the female Buddha, Samantabhadri. But this state of mind is not just blank emptiness. It is unobstructed, sparkling, pure and vibrant. This mind is the male Buddha, Samantabhadra. These two, your mind whose nature is emptiness without any substance whatever, and your mind which is vibrant and luminous, are inseparable. This is the Dharmakaya of the Buddha. This mind of yours is inseparable luminosity and emptiness in the form of a great mass of light. It has no birth or death, therefore it is the Buddha of immortal light. To recognize this is all that is necessary. When you recognize this pure nature of your mind as the Buddha, looking into your own mind is resting in the Buddha mind. So my favorite reading, that passage, which you sort of read again and again, you get some vague hint of what's been got at, and then it slips out of your mind again. But uh, let's just sort of dwell on those last words that looking into your own mind is uh, resting in the Buddha mind. Um, when you recognize the pure nature of your mind as the Buddha, looking into your own mind is resting in the Buddha mind. So, I'm sorry, you, uh, uh, you asked for this, if you see what I mean. You came along to a talk on this subject, so what else can I do? Uh, but I hope that you've got some sort of faint grip on it, not grip on it, some faint sense of what's being talked about. What, what, what's the practical payload of this? Uh, because it sounds just so rarefied, you might think, well, why are we bothering with this? Um, I think, first of all, it's quite good every now and again just to have a, a glimpse of the pinnacle, if you see what I mean. What is going to happen uh, if we continue this path that we've taken some baby steps on. Where is it leading? I, I find it valuable to go to the top of the mountain just to see where it, it, where it goes to. 
then forget about it and just get on with getting up there. But it's good to see the top of the mountain and, and to know something of it. And maybe in seeing the top of the mountain, you get some idea of why you're doing it and even some sense of, well, actually, it's not so alien to your experience. So, yes, we, we get some glimpse of the top of the mountain. We get a glimpse of what happens to the Buddha after he dies. He doesn't, again, recreate an identity. He doesn't recreate a birth because he's freed himself from that. He just rests in this uh, nature of mind itself, free from all identity, free from all clinging. So yes, we get a glimpse of the top of the mountain. We also get a sense of what we've got to do. At a center like this, we will be introducing you to the basic steps you need to take in order to be able to finally absorb this sort of experience. Because we're so deeply embedded in the world, so deeply embedded in conditions, we cling on to them so hard. You know, you know what happens when something goes wrong, when you lose something, when somebody close to you dies. You know what you feel when a, a relationship breaks up. You know what you feel even when you, you lose your job or something like that. You know what you feel. You become so attached to it, it's become part of who you are. So when it breaks down, it's, it's devastating. It can be really devastating. Not as devastating as death will be, but it's a little mini death. Uh, and uh, so we're training ourselves, well, in a way you could say training ourselves to die. It doesn't sound very encouraging, does it? Come to the old <laughs> and learn how to die. Um, but uh, if you see what I mean, metaphorically, well, maybe even literally, that is what we're doing. We're learning to connect with our own deepest nature. And slowly, slowly, it doesn't happen very quickly. Some may be capable of that because of their past karma, their past training. Some people go very slowly, some people go very quickly, some people go backwards, some people go forwards. <laughs> but um, we're working towards that point, the point at which we can realize the nature of our minds. We can realize that, that Buddha mind for ourselves, not by finding it somewhere else, but finding it within ourselves. It's a potential, you could say, within us. In a certain sense, it even is within us, but not too literally. Uh, our minds are ultimately that mind. So this is, I think, the first thing that we can draw from this. We've got a glimpse of the, the goal, and we can see what we're trying to do. We're trying to gain some focus. We're trying to gain some emotional positivity. That's what we do through uh, Anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, and metta bhavna. We're sort of training ourselves to... Uh, to be able to stay with it. And we're tra training ourselves to do that in a positive way, with a positive spirit, and a positive connection with others. Then we'll go on to learn how to let go more and more and more deeply. Of course, we do that at every stage, but we're learning to let go of all the things that, w that we're attached to. Uh, not to become indifferent, uh, it's not that as you let go you become a sort of cold-hearted um, robot. You can see that's what the Buddha is getting at here, that this side of um, emptiness and luminosity. You're, you're developing that within yourself at lower levels. Yes, you're, you're more free, that corresponds to the emptiness, but you're more vibrant, more alive, more engaged, more, more connected. That corresponds to the luminosity side, if you see what I mean, at a lower level. So yes, that's, that's what we're fundamentally doing here. We are doing it, those of us who are um, uh, 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 inflicted upon you uh, to, to teach you the Dhamma, we're doing it ourselves. Uh, we're somewhere on the way towards that. And we're, we're trying to give you the tools and the, uh, the understanding so that you can do it too, as far as you want to go. You go as far or as uh, um, less as you wish. But there's another reason I think it's extremely important that this this had a huge effect on me when I when I came across it. I, interestingly enough, I think my uh, my engagement with Buddhism was very much formed by reading the Book of the Dead. I, as I said, I uh, under certain influences, um, uh, I I happened to read uh, both an extract from the Book of the Dead and Timothy Leary's um, adaptation of it to the Acid Trip. Um, 
but uh, that, that it really rang true to me. It rang true to my direct experience. I've experienced something of this unfolding, this, uh, this uh, fading away. I've experienced it for myself. Not, of course, right up into the pinnacle, but I know the direction of it in my own experience. And that uh, brought me into the Dhamma. But what I realised it did, it, it cured me, or began to cure me, of my materialism. Uh, it began to sort of shake me from the kind of automatic sense that life is just about matter. And that awareness is simply, well, that was the famous phrase, an epiphenomenon of matter. It's just molecules and atoms rubbing against each other, and boom, here's a world. Um, it's absolutely absurd when you think about it. Um, but we're all, well, I can't speak for everybody here, but I think it's a very strong element in, uh, in the cultures around us that we believe the world is just matter, uh, even if we have other beliefs. Often there's still sort of, um, you know, a bit of dressing on the top of uh, a fundamental materialism. And that materialism, of course, breeds despair. I spoke quite a bit about that uh, two nights ago. Uh, that sort of sense that life has no larger meaning breeds a, a, a deep sense of, uh, what was it, the knot of anxiety and despair. Uh, and I felt that very much as a young man, uh, that knot of anxiety and despair, because it just didn't seem to add up to anything. Why bother to turn up if it's just a few moments of pleasure every now and again and quite a bit of, uh, of drudgery and, uh, at worst, of course, pain? Um, so connecting with Buddhism in general, but particularly with the Book of the Dead and, and this sort of teaching, connecting me with the fact that fundamentally the universe is beneficial. Do you see what I mean? The universe is in a way you could say good. The universe is, is, is uh, not just a big blank hole within which by an accident of I don't know what uh, things have come about and uh, one day they'll just disappear. The lights will go out. Uh, the universe is underlain by something supremely positive, let's put it like that, which is, of course, a terrible understatement. Um, it's something infinitely desirable, infinitely satisfying, infinitely fulfilling. All our fulfillments uh, in this life are sort of prefigurations of that final fulfillment. You know, the, 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 the deep uh, aesthetic pleasure we get is a sort of uh, an echo of the ultimate beauty of reality itself, of the creative power of reality, because it's from this state, this level, that everything emerges. The whole of reality emerges from this, uh, uh, this ultimate state. So that, uh, for me, this is the most important thing about Buddhism, in, in my direct experience, that I, I learned that this life is, uh, takes place within a context of a universe, of a reality that is supremely positive, supremely beneficial. You could even say supremely good. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not, as it were, indifferent and merely, uh, what is it, um, uh, um, as, as, um, uh, as uh, I can't remember the word, sorry. My Shakespeare is not immediately in my mind. As, as ants to the gods are we, they kill us for their sport. Um, it just sort of, uh, we're just playthings of, of fate. Uh, and sometimes you get a good hand, sometimes you get a bad hand, it's completely arbitrary, and so on. But it's not like that. There is an ultimate meaning. Even if we're a long way from it, and even if it seems rather frightening at the moment, because... Of course, that ultimate reality kind of denies me, little old Sabuti. It, it sort of uh, goes vastly beyond who I think I am and who I'm quite attached to being. I quite like being Sabuti. Um, um, uh, on the whole, not always. Um, not everybody else does, of course, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, um, 
Yeah, it, 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 our, our attachment to that means it's that this idea of this ultimate empty luminosity is quite frightening, quite overwhelming. It sort of denies me as I think I am. But uh, at the same time, knowing of this and sort of believing in this, even experiencing this at a distance, gives one a sense that, that life has real meaning and that it is uh, a fundamentally beneficial business, that it has a purpose. And that purpose is, of course, attaining this state so you're free. And from that state of freedom, you can be of infinite benefit to others because you have no selfish uh, position to take. You're totally free from all self-interest. So I invite you to reflect on this if, if uh, you've not thought about these things before. But Buddhism does not teach that there's a God, but it doesn't teach that there's a nothing, if you see what I mean. It doesn't teach that it's just blank emptiness. It teaches that the ultimate nature of things, yes, it's empty in the sense it's completely free, nothing limiting it, nothing defining it. At the same time, it's luminous, vibrant, sparkling. I love that word, sparkling, uh, shining. Uh, and uh, the two coexist, as it were. Um, well, not, not even coexist, they're completely the same. So that is the nature of things. Even if we're not ready for it, well, it gives us some sort of sense that life has meaning, life has hope, uh, life has purpose, an ultimate purpose. So I've taken you rather a big journey. Um, I've got you dying, and I've <laughs> thrown you into the luminous void. Uh, but I hope that you, you'll, you'll take something of uh, what I'm inviting you to take, which is a sense that, ah, if I keep practicing, I'll be able to embrace this. What does it say? Um, uh, yes, uh, recognize it and rest in it. Rest in it. Not, you know, because it's a, a friend. It's, it's something desirable. Oh, phew. All that fighting, you know. The preservation of one's identity absorbs a huge amount of energy and a huge amount of effort and anxiety and pain. It gives its pleasures, yes, I know. But it, on the whole, it's, it's, a, it's a struggle. So there's a point at which you just relax. You're completely free of that struggle. And you're relaxing into something that is not just nothingness. It's something supremely beneficial beneficent and beautiful and true so yes that's uh, that's where you're going in so far as you stepped into the center don't worry you go at your own pace when you're ready but know that from the Buddhist point of view this life it has meaning and that it is a good meaning it's ultimately good so, thank you very much for bearing with me. Uh, this rather tough topic, but uh, I certainly felt quite engaged myself in that dimension <laughs> while I was reading it, so I hope that something came through to you. Thank you very much.